I'm alive uh -huh. Feeling good, yeah. alright And you can take yeah. my joy Cause the world no. didn't give it to me You can take my joy Cause the world no. didn't give it to me no. I'm free, Come on. I'm alive Feeling good Ladies and chapter 4 verse 6 Because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into our hearts Crying, Abba, Father you guys notice that the first time God sent the Son was 2,000 years ago to be born in a manger, right? To live for us, to die for us, to be raised from the dead for us. But then the second time God sent forth His Son was not in the body of Jesus, but was in you <laughs> and in me. He did send forth a different Jesus. The same Jesus. The Spirit of Jesus. Do you know that it was the Spirit of Jesus that made Him awesome? It wasn't His, it wasn't his body. It wasn't His mind. It wasn't His money. It wasn't His upbringing. It, he was just like you and me. It was His Spirit that made Him awesome. Amen. When Jesus was laying in the manger, how old was He? You ever think about that? He was just born. He was just born, wasn't he? Yeah. He was just born. So how old was he? Like a month old. Like a day or a month? Yeah. yeah. But you know what? That was his humanity. It was Christmas. But the baby who was living in that, who, there was a spirit that was inside that baby that had been alive from before the foundations of the world. That's why the Word of God says that He will be called the Ancient of Days. The baby laying in that manger, His body was just one day old or one month old. But the baby laying in that manger was ancient. That baby, that had been around from before the foundations of the world. Now he wasn't laying in the manger saying, wait till they check me out. He, he, was, he was laying in the manger just like a baby. Because he had to grow in wisdom, grow in stature, grow in favor with man and with God. He grew just like you and I grow. But he grew with a living spirit so that as he was growing, he was also abiding in his spirit so that at the age of 12, we know that he learned, God is my father. My father's not on the earth. He's the father of my body, but he's not my father. I've got a father who's been my father for a lot longer than Joseph. <laughs> you understand? Joseph's only been taking care of me for 12 years, but I've got a father that's been fathering me before time began. Wow. Because that baby is Alpha and Omega. Now, I want you to understand something. We're going to talk about the old has gone. Right? Because the new spirit, the spirit of Jesus, is a spirit that's doing what? Crying, Abba, Father. There's an activity of the Spirit of the Lord Jesus Christ. And you're going to experience that activity moving your heart, taking your heart to places that your mind sometimes won't, won't, won't allow your heart to get to. But you're, the Spirit of Jesus is drawing your heart into heart to heart face to face, spirit to spirit, encounter and fellowship with the living God. Why? Because that's the direction that river flows. He just goes that way because the Son has always been face to face with the Father. He's been with the Father. He's been always in the bosom of the Father. You got that from, from John, the Gospel of John. But the Son who abides in the bosom of the Father has made Him known to us. He didn't stop abiding in the embrace of the Father to, to take on flesh. He just put flesh over His embrace of the Father. So that when He lived among us, 
We got to see this invisible fellowship between the Father and the Son and the Spirit being made visible. We were made to participate in that. God just is that way. That when He envisioned us being image bearers, He did not envision us living independent from Him. He envisioned someone else that I can allow to participate in the same relationship I have with my son. And the way we're going to do that is that I'm going to adopt them into Christ. <clears throat> and I'm going to put Christ into them so that His Spirit is in them. But they get to experience my love for the Son because they, they come to me in the Son, clothed in the firstborn. They don't have to establish something on their own outside of them. I just include them in something that's already up and running. Isn't that good? Yeah. I mean, it's one thing to go out and start your own business. It's another thing for somebody to give you the profits of that business and say, you don't here, it's yours. You don't have to do all the work to get it. I'll just give you something. It's up and running. Live off the inheritance. Amen. And that's what the Word of God says. Verse 7. Therefore, in Galatians chapter 4, you are no longer a slave but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. Hey, Jesus Christ has got this huge inheritance. Amen. You've got to adopt him into him. You get what he gets. Hallelujah. He won the victory over all sin, over all death. He won the victory. What? To be with God forever, to restore it. And you've been made an heir, a co-heir, a joint heir with Jesus Christ. That's good news. I always, you know, it's kind of neat to think that you can be one of them rich people just living off your interest. Living off the inheritance. Spiritually, that's what you are. You have you are that's what I get to preach. I get to preach the unfathomable riches of the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ to us Gentiles. <laughs> and there might be a few Jews, I'll preach it to you too. It's okay. Because in Christ there is no Jew or Gentile. There's you leave that outside. There's only the in Christ humanity. He's our culture. Alright? So I want to talk about all the old things passed away because it's the old things that try to keep us from, from living only by the Spirit of Jesus. Because the Spirit of Jesus is always turned towards the Father with Abba Father, right? What is that? That, that word Abba is the Jewish word for Daddy. Like if you go to New York or, or around a, a Jewish family, you'll have the little kids come to you and say, Abba, Abba. You know, they, they want, that's just how they go, Daddy, Daddy, Daddy. You know, even when I was, even when I was, you know, even when my dad was alive, I didn't call him Daddy. You know, I, maybe until I was like five. Then after five, you know, I was calling, I was calling you Dad. Because yeah, now I'm going to school and I don't want to. <laughs> Hi, Daddy. You know? Because there's something in our fleshly nature that to have a close, emotionally interdependent relationship, an affectionate relationship, it makes you, it's that, it's that psychosis that we see to the nth degree in the children that are suffering with wrath. And we think that, that growing up means growing more distant, more independent. And there's a sense uh, of that that's right, but relationally, it ought not be. God created us for constant interdependence, the constant love, where it's okay for us to be small. For us to be young. For us to be like children. Amen. Jesus said, don't come to me trying to establish a relationship based on your competence. That's what adults do. Show me your resume. My hire you. Right? Let's see what you're worth. Based on the things that you've done. God says, psh, psh, forget your resume. I'll show you what, what you're worth. Look at my son hanging on the cross. 
that's what you're worth to me. I don't want to give you a job. I want to give you myself as your father forever. I want to give you my son's relationship with me and make you a joint heir with him. You ready for that? That's good. That's good. So what do I need to do? Well, just be willing to receive my son. Receive my love. Receive me as your father. Okay, good. How do you hit the on button? All right, just do this. There's a spirit now that just got put inside you when you got born again. Deep. Uh, more deep than your emotions. More deep than your thoughts. In your inmost beings, what the scriptures call it. Rivers of living water are now flowing out from your inmost being. What are those rivers doing? Well, the river is flowing into your heart, carrying your heart into fellowship with God. Abba, Father, Daddy, 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 I love you. This is not just me talking and God's out there. This is in my spirit is Jesus Christ. Christ lives in me. Guess what? The Father is in the Son. So I just step into the Son. He is the door. Right? So what do you do? You step into the door. You put the Son on. You step into Him. And all of a sudden you are in the presence of the Father. No man can come to the Father except through me. Right? So we're taught, we're preached the gospel all the time. You need to believe on Jesus so you can get your sin forgiven and go to heaven. That's not the gospel that, that Jesus preached or the apostles preached. They said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, get your sins forgiven so that you can come to the Father forever. He brings us into relationship. He doesn't, he's not just a ticket stamp to, to change your destination. He's not just an airplane to get you where you want to go at the end of your life. He actually brings you out of alienation, out of separation, out of abandonment, out of shame, and brings you into the embrace of Almighty God as your Father that starts now and lasts forever. Because you were created for eternity. That environment of being in Christ. What got pulled over our eyes is a temporal living. And the biggest deception that the enemy brings into you is this. Is he tries to convince you that this life is all that matters. This 70 years is all you got. And if stuff's going on here, well, you know, what good is God if he can't make this work? And, and, the, and Jesus shows us the exact opposite. Is he laid his life down. His temporal life down. He reversed the stupidity of Adam and Eve where they said, you know what? We'll trade eternity for temporal pleasures. And now look at what it got them. And the day you eat of it, you shall die. Now all of a sudden, they've got 70 years or if you live before the flood, before the cataclysmic changes in the environment, you know, you might live to be 900 years or whatever. The environment changed, I believe, is why we had that. And then after the flood, you start seeing the lifespan get really, really short. Okay? I'm not a scientist or a son of a scientist, but that's what I've read. <laughs> and that makes sense. Uh, but anyway... We were created for eternity. And now, when you come into Christ, you reverse that. Your, your life in this world, you say, hey, that's dead. There's not life from here. I'm not looking for life from what I can get out here. I've got life given to me as a gift from Christ for all eternity. Life, joy, peace, love, security, holiness. Never be abandoned, never be rejected, never be failed. That will never fail me or forsake me. Jesus died and what did he do? He rose again to display the life that is stronger than death, the life that's on the other side of that world. That's the life I give to you. And you know what? Romans 6 says this, when you've been baptized into Christ, you've been baptized into his death. And so you've, been, you've died to sin. Why? So that you might be raised with Christ. 
and live in newness of life. So therefore, present yourself to God as those alive from the dead. Amen. How do you present yourself to God? Oh God, I suck. Oh God, I'm struggling. Oh God. You know what? Listen to yourself. You're resurrected, seated with Christ in heavenly places. Hallelujah. Present yourself to God from there. In Christ. Raised with Him. You're already on the other side of death. You're already on the other side of judgment. In your spirit. Amen. That's not make-believe. That's how God sees you. He is spirit. He looks at your spirit. He sees you from the inside out. Don't go to Onward to Nineveh? <laughs> Don't what? go there. <laughs> so where's Nineveh? I don't know. Nineveh is in the books of C.S. Lewis, sweetheart, but it's a great illustration of exactly what we're talking about, isn't it? It's another realm that represents the kingdom of heaven in some ways. Yeah, it's like we're the wardrobe. And that inside of us is this whole other world that's very, very real. Okay? And that's what Jesus had. He, but he, on the other side of that wardrobe wasn't the white witch. It was just Aslan in his kingdom. And it was perfect. Okay? So that's exactly what we've been brought into. So that we can live in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. That we can live out of our sonship. Ephesians chapter 2 says, Therefore you've been raised with Christ, seated with Him in heavenly places. That's good. So you're not trying to fight to get acceptance by behaving. You're not trying to maintain the good pleasure of God. Jesus Christ purchased that for you. You are living in rest. Just the same way that Jesus has ceased from all His works. Why? He sat down. Because the Father said, there's nothing more for you to do, man. You did. Just rest. Enjoy what you've accomplished. Because, listen, what you've released on the earth is like the tsunami that just keep running and running and running, man. It's just like it's like watching the, this is probably a bad idea, but it's kind of like watching the toilet swirl. You know, once you make the flush, you know, it's, it's going to happen. You know, all the bad stuff's out of there. Eventually, the, the new creation water comes in. All right, that's probably a bad illustration. All right, sorry, guys. This happens that way. Alright, but you can be, you get that, right? Once you once the cross and resurrection happen, boom, now it's all in place. It, it's everything's in motion. So the son's resting. He's not up there wringing his hands, working, trying to figure out, well, how am I gonna get this happening? He's not doing that. He's just like, man, this is cool. And that's where we start our Christian life. I've received the good of that. Look, I've succeeded at life. I've discovered what life is truly about. I've come back to my Creator. I've become a container of His nature. Now, I am not living to try to get to heaven. I am living from heaven. I am, I, my body has become the avatar through which I'm living from the throne. I'm sitting up there playing the video game every day. And now, it's no longer I who live but it's Christ who's living through me. It's actually, He's got His hands on the joystick. Or the controllers. <laughs> you can tell. I mean, I used to play Atari way back in the <laughs> Way back with the video game, but first and then it. You know, dinosaur game with the, you know, the palm. <laughs> <laughs> Alright. Alright. So, stepping back into the now time. We, uh, so that's how we live. But in order to live that way, we need to understand that the old really is gone. That the old really is gone. That He makes all things new. So what did God do? Alright. You know that if Adam would have died, if somehow the serpent would have come and uh, like uh, bit him with poison, and so that he died right there before he and Eve were able to uh, give birth to... Uh, any progeny, do you understand that the entire human race would have died inside of Adam? Because all them little sperms that grew up to become human beings, they had more sperms, you know, eventually one of them was you. 
One of them was me. We Physically, we were all inside of Adam. Right? So in Romans 5, it talks about this whole human race that was in Adam. And Adam was the head of the human race. Why? Because he was the oldest one. He was the one in, in whom we were. So when Adam fell and, uh, and, and went into rebellion, the whole human race went into uh, rebellion and was kidnapped with him. If, you, if, if I get taken to Siberia with, with my wife, you know, that all of our progeny gets taken to Siberia too. You understand? We get, we get kidnapped. All right? So we got kidnapped by the devil, taken out from, from that relationship that we were to abide in. The corruption that, was in, that entered into our nature got passed on through generation to generation. Now, here's something cool. Who's older, Adam or the Son of God? The Son of God, right? So he's older. So, why? Because he's the Ancient of Days. Time, time begins and ends in him. Do you understand? Before he said, let there be light, there was no time. I don't understand that, but that's what Einstein's theory of relativity explains, that time is a, is a matter and a light thing. So before there's light and matter, there's just not time. There's no progress of time. So time begins and ends inside of Jesus Christ. I'm not smart enough to understand it. It's just what scientists tell me. I understand that you know that. But it's true in the Bible too. So just a second here. So he is Alpha. And one day in the future, he's going to be Omega, right? You see my fingers? Alpha and Omega, beginning and end. That's what that means. Jesus is called that. So you got Alpha, you got Omega, Alpha, Omega. Wait a second. He he is the beginning and the end. He's out. Is he in time, bound by time, or he is he beyond time as well? So he's Alpha, he's Omega, and here you got time starting and beginning. It's like me reading the Bible. I can go back and read Genesis. I can access the, before Adam and Eve were there. By reading, I can go and read the book, the end of the book of Revelation, when you got the New Jerusalem coming down. I can access it that way. I can. All of this can come into my now experience in my mind, right? God's like that for real. He can be at the beginning and the end, and before the beginning and after the end. He's not just omnipresent. He's omnitemporal. He's not just omnitemporal. He's extra temporal. You get that? All right? So, when that person... Remember yesterday I said God put the whole creation in Christ? So when that one, in whom is all the creation, when that one steps into creation, now who's the oldest human being? Jesus Christ is. Now he's the oldest human being. Now he's the head of the human race. Now guess what? The whole human race is in Jesus Christ. Because the whole creation is in him. And so he is no longer living for himself. Everything he's doing is redemptively. So he has organically become, he is partaking of flesh and blood. Right? Right? He has become one with our humanity. You can't become more one with our humanity than Jesus Christ did. Every bit of it. And He lived for us. And He lived for us. He lived as us. He was representing us to the Father. And the Father was saying, Yes, Son, I have. When He died, He died for us. He died as us, representing the whole human race to the Father. We were in Jesus Christ. So He carried us to the cross. He became one with our sin. He who knew no sin was made sin for us. 
so that when He died, you were in Jesus Christ and you died in Him. The same way that you were a sperm inside of Adam, you were marked out inside of Jesus Christ and the old you died in Him. That's good to know. That's really how God sees. Do you understand? God is seeing all of this stuff in Christ. It's really His perspective. So when He's loving the Son, He sees His human life, but He's relating to Him from all that He is in eternity. So when the Son dies, the Son all died in Him. That's what 2 Corinthians says. When Therefore, when Christ died, remember, you want to go there? We read that a little bit earlier this morning. It's a good time to read it again. I don't want to just... Verse 14, for the love of Christ controls us. There's some conclusions you got to reach. That one died for all, therefore, how many died? All died. That's good to know. You know what death does? Is it sets you free from stuff. You're not going to struggle with temptation when you die. Really? You're not. You know what else? You're not gonna you're not gonna have any fears or inhibitions when you die. You're not gonna worry about how you look. That's really good. You're gonna be dead to this world. This world's gonna be dead to you when you die. You're gonna get to go to heaven when you die. I want to give you good news. If you're in Christ, you're already dead. You're already dead in the world. You're already, you don't have to struggle with temptation. You really don't have to fight it. I know, I know sometimes the experience is different. Okay. I understand. But I want you to, you need to believe and understand that sin has no right. It has no master over you. You're not even under law anymore. That's what the Word of God says. They don't have laws in graveyards. Hey, no running around at night. You know, we're going to arrest any corpse that's caught out running around at night. No switching coffins. You know, they, they don't have any laws for dead people. It talks about this in Romans 7 that if a woman is married uh, to somebody, she's under that law because the law is attached to this living husband. But if the husband dies, the law that was attached to that husband goes with it. Now she's free to be married to someone else. She's not free to be her own thing and do her own thing. She's joined to somebody else. And you need to understand that you are the old you that was under law, that was under condemnation, that was under shame, that was under guilt. That you died in Jesus Christ because He's able to reach forward into time and to look at everything that has ever happened to you that was ever done to you, that was that you ever did wrong, that you did apart from Him, and He said, I will become one with that. Ah, and He took it all into Himself like this big sponge, and He took it into the grave. Boom! And it died. That's really cool. He drowned it there. <laughs> it did not come back up on the other side. All that came up on the other side was the new creation in Christ. And He didn't just die for us all. He was raised for us all. Do you understand what that means? That Jesus didn't just come out of the grave for His own victory. He came out of the grave as your victory. Everything. I mean, what, what is it that put Jesus in the grave? It was corrupt government, right? Don't fear corrupt government, folks. Jesus has already overcome it. It was religious bigotry and, and judgmentalism, right? The Bible believers that didn't believe the Bible, <laughs> you know, didn't understand the Father's heart. They put him in the grave. It was lies and rumors and people misunderstanding him and refusing to see him for who he really was. They didn't define Him as the Father defined Him. They defined Him according to their own flesh. That put Him in the grave. 
And when he died, he rose again. He overcame it all. He said, look, they did the best they could. Is that all you got? Is that all you got? I'm still here. I'm still here. And they're like, yeah, that, that's, that's really all we had. <laughs> I guess, you know, and that's why in Ephesians chapter 1, Paul prays that we would know the power of God that's directed towards us. The same power that raised Jesus from the dead. And not only that, after he was raised from the dead, he's like, who's going to stop me? I'm going to go sit up on that throne. Now I'm going to start running. I'm going to, I'm going to be exalted. And there's going to be a man, a human being on the throne of God. That's why in the book of Revelation it says that unto him were given all wisdom, all glory, all riches, all honor. You see, as the son before the incarnation, he had all that as God. He set it all aside to live as a man. He lived as a man. He died as a man. He rose as a man. He is ascended as a man. But guess what? You're in Him. And then He received everything that He set aside. Now He's got it as a man. Everything that He was as God, now He is as a man. That is awesome. Because that's what God created you and me to be. The living man of God. He was the all. Now He is the all in all. He is the all in all. See, because He created stuff to contain Him. He created people to contain Him. Now He is the all in all. Let Him be all in you. Let Him be in everything in you. So there's things sometimes that are going around, listen, that, that are up there, that you feel things, that you think things, and you know they're not from that spirit of Abba, Father. Abba, Father. Just being face to face, heart to heart with God. You know what? Don't let them drag you out of that place. Just go. Be right there. Don't let your mind take you out. Just go. Let your heart and the Spirit of Christ let you be face to face with the living God. Just enjoy being loved completely. And He's not trying to improve you. He wants you to realize how perfectly accepted and how perfect you really are. And that stuff that needs to be improved doesn't need to be improved. It needs to be put off. See, it's not, it's not really you. It's something that's outside of you that came onto you. That's why you put it off. But you put on the new man. It's what's in you. He's in there. Put him on, right? So it's like it's like a Superman. You know, he he wore who he really was on the inside. So he went into the booth not to put stuff on, but to take stuff off, right? And that's what we got to do when we find that we're walking around like Clark Kent. We just take stuff off. Say, no, I ain't Clark Kent anymore. I'm not a nerdy. God. Does that make do you understand that? That's different. Let me tell you how this works a little bit. Uh, if you got a Bible, turn to John 13. Got a little bit of time. Okay. Let me set the stage. You know that this is, Jesus is about ready to leave. It's the time for the Last Supper. And he gets up to wash the disciples' feet. Because they had come into the room and they used to have a, and that's, in that society it's customary to have a, a servant or a slave available to wash the feet. There was no servant or slave available, so they just kind of made this unspoken agreement. Listen. I'm not going to ask you to wash my feet. She asked me to wash yours. Let's just eat. Right? <laughs> that's, that's the way it was. And we kind of get these little unspoken agreements. And we think it's all right. Because nobody's fighting. Nobody's fussing. It seems reasonable to us. And Jesus, he begins to eat with them. But look, it says that, uh, that during... Let's see where it is. 
in verse 4, verse 3, it says, Knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come forth from God and was going back to God. Okay, See, Jesus knew who he was from the eternals. He was filled with that. Right? So now he's still living with guys with issues. <laughs> and it's the very last day he's going to be with them. And they still haven't gone yet. Come on, guys, we're trying to save the world, and you're still messing up. You know, you could have this all kind of pressure on you. That's not how Jesus lived. Why? Because he wasn't asking for us to get it. He, he was just living out of who he was and treating us not how we deserve, but out of, out of how he saw us. Okay? And then he says he got up from supper. You know what that tells me? He actually sat down to supper. He, he was fellowshipping with them while they had these bad attitudes. He, he wasn't like, y'all ain't going to wash one of those feet, I ain't going to eat with you. And, and a lot of times, the gospel that we get preached from, and, and you know, it's like, you got anything wrong with you, God doesn't want a thing to do with you. Sorry. God is a God of grace. And He moves into our life with grace. He didn't just sit there. He got up. There were some things that he wanted to, to make adjustments about. He said he laid aside his garment, taking a towel, he girded himself, and he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet, wiping with the towel which he was girded. He wasn't doing anything for show or nothing. He was just new and what needed to be done. He saw a need and he started washing feet. Okay? So then he comes to Peter. And Peter says, Lord, do you wash my feet? And Jesus answered says, what I do, you do not realize now, but you will understand hereafter. So this is something more than just washing feet. You know, I mean, of course you're washing my feet. But this is, this is I believe, Jesus uh, do, enacting the reality of what he's about to do at the cross. He's about to wash us completely clean, okay? Okay. Uh, and, but you're going to understand it in a little bit, what I did, what I'm doing now. But, okay, like, just relax and let me just do this now. You're going to understand it later. You understand that God understands what we don't understand? Isn't that good? Yeah. And He's a good Father. Sometimes we get so worried about trying to hear God's voice and do His will and get His direction. A lot of times I just get li real little. I say, God, I'm a child. You're just going to have to leave me. I know you're trying to show me. And uh, you know that I don't always get it, but I know that you're always able to understand what I do and don't get, and I want to follow you, and I trust you. Isn't that good? It just takes all the pressure off of us and puts it all right on him. And he's like, good, good, I enjoy that. Thanks for telling me. You know? Well, he poured water in the basin, blah, 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 and he says, all right. Peter says, never shall you wash my feet. Jesus answered, if I do not wash you, you have no part with me. Okay, so now it's starting to come a little bit clearer. Jesus is not just talking about getting your foot washed. He's talking about whether you are having a partnership, a fellowship, a participation in me. And Jesus, and Peter's like, he's the first charismatic. You know, he's like, then give me a bath. You know, just pour it out on me, you know. Jesus says uh, in verse 10, He says, you've already bathed. You're already clean. You just need your feet washed. Now here's what I want to tell you. Peter had dirty feet. But Jesus' definition of Peter is you are bathed clean. You are clean. You're not dirty. You got dirty feet, but you're clean. You're not that dirty, dirty footed disciple. You're clean. So what I'm doing is I'm washing off from you that which is not you, that which accumulated to you by that part of you that still touches the earth. But who you are to me is that clean one. You're completely bathed. And so all I'm doing, it, you need to allow me to freshly touch you and apply my grace to wash off from you that which is not you. And a lot of times the enemy comes to me, comes to you and to me, and says, look at that dirt. See, you're dirty, you're dirty, you're dirty. 
God doesn't want to touch you because of that dirt. No, that's where God wants to touch you. He wants to touch you because of that dirt. You know why? He doesn't look at you as the dirty one. He looks at you as the clean one who got a little dirt on him. Do you understand that? 1 John 1, 9, we're always taught this. If we confess our sins, He's faithful and righteous to cleanse us from all sin and all unrighteousness. Right? Forgive us our sin, cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Alright, so then sometimes you get people that teach that like, if you don't confess it, God ain't cleansing it. I'm sorry, look, if you confess your sin, you don't have to go around thinking, well, maybe there's a sin I didn't confess. You know? Because that word says, look, listen, if you're confessing your sin, you're not confessing your sin as a sinner. You're not a sinner. You're a saint. You're a holy one. Your identity, and, and I can tell why well, I need to hit this a little bit, because sometimes you identify yourself as a sinner saved by grace. You are saved by grace as a sinner, but as soon as you're saved, you are no longer a sinner. God changes your nature. Amen. He put, He makes, you, gives you a clean heart, and He declares you righteous. He makes you righteous. Now you are a righteous one. You are a holy one. That's what saint means. And it's not just on the outside. He made you new on the inside. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, First John, it, it, it says, Greater is He who is in you than he who is in the world. Human beings contain someone else's spiritual nature. You don't have a spiritual nature of your own. Okay? You're either containing and manifesting as an unbelieving sinner the nature of the he who's in the world, or you are containing and uh, manifesting the he who is in you who's greater. Amen. You don't contain both. Do you understand that? He takes from you the heart of stone and puts into you a living heart. Right? Amen. He does. So even though you can still sin, you're participating in an old nature that's not yours anymore. But your true nature is righteousness. So you're not even the one, you're the clean one who got dirt on them because there's still a part of you that touches the earth and the earth can touch you. The dirt can still touch you. You can still get it on you. But it's not you anymore. Do you understand that? That's good. You really need to... See, I mean, that's what Paul says. While we were yet sinners. What does that mean? Way back then, we were sinners. But we've been made righteous. We've been washed. We've been cleansed. We're not that way anymore. So if He loved us before we even cared about His will... How about, how about now when we really care about His will? See, the enemy tries to use the fact that your heart's been made new to accuse you. I want to be clean. I want to be clean. That's why Peter says, give me a path. Right? I've got to participate in you. And Jesus says to him, no, look, you are clean. You are clean. That's why you love cleanness. That's why you love to partake of me. You don't need a bath. You're not the dirty person. I don't define you by the dirt you got on you. I define you by the cleanness that I put in you. So live in Christ. Yesterday there was uh, several of you who, who mentioned, I've got these feelings, you know. And the feelings and the thoughts sometimes come to you with this accusation of, oh, I'm, I must still be broken. I'm still this. I'm still that. And you identify yourself with the, with the feeling. You know, as, as if that is truly who you are. Right? Instead of, hey, you're getting some discernment about you because you knew enough to say, that's not really me. I want to wash off of me. Right? And so there's something rising up. Before, you used to carry this stuff around and it was just you. You didn't think about anything else, right? Now you're like, that's not me. That's not me. And God's like, you got it, baby. You, that ain't you. You are clean. I used to love 
to go around and have uh, immoral sex with girls. You know, I mean, it used to be something that it was like, ching, baby, you know, I, uh, that's what I wanted to do. I used to love to go out and get drunk. I used to love to go out and get high. And then the righteousness of Christ came into me, and I could get tempted by stuff like that. I could, uh, but I tell you what, if I ever got it on me or came near it or uh, did something to act on it or had temptations, I began to realize my heart was not in that anymore. And so look, the enemy comes to you and tries to accuse you. See, you have changed a bit. You have changed a bit. Well, why do I hate this so much? That ain't me no more. I ain't even that person anymore. The old is gone. I'm dead. And I'm new in Christ. I'm risen. He, he died as me. He died for me. I died in Him. He rose. He rose for me. He's ascended for me. And I'm in Him. And when I called on His name, out from Him came new life that's in me. So there's an umbilical cord from heaven that's going on supplying me with everything that's in Him. And the Father looks inside the Son and sees all these umbilical cords and these babies going, ah, 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 ah. <laughs> They're in you. I love the children that are in you. I've got more sons and daughters in you. Those are the ones that I've adopted. Go, here's your son, okay? Go to God in Christ. And let the Spirit of Christ just come out of you. Just enjoy being in the presence of God. Completely accepted. Completely loved. Treated and looked upon. Just as Christ. Get in His lap and let the Father look in your eyes. And gaze back at Him and let Him really just enjoy you. And you enjoy being enjoyed. Can you begin to carve out some time in your prayer time with God to do that? I'd encourage you, spend some time each day doing that. Do your best, like Jesus said, when you pray, pray to the Father who's in heaven and shut the door. Forget everything outside. Forget this world. Just step right into eternity. I don't wait to go to heaven when I die. I'm already dead. I go to heaven every day. I live in heaven. I live from heaven to the earth. That's where we are. It's what the Word of God teaches. We're seated with Christ in heavenly places, folks. That ain't some crazy man up here pumping off. And I hope you see, do you see this is real? That this transforms everything? This isn't me trying to fix you guys? Didn't that feel good to have somebody come in? I don't know how many people might come in here trying to fix you with the Bible. But I'm trying to tell you, I don't need to fix you. I just want to tell you, you're fixed. Amen. This is great. Enjoy this. Come on in. The water's fine. If you get out and stepped in the mud, well, hey, you know, put your feet under the shower and jump back in. You're clean. This is good. You're not shut out from this. You didn't earn this. You can't break this. This has been going on for eternity. This is solid. You can build your life on this. You can rebuild your life on this because this is life. This is stronger than death. Stronger than the devil. Stronger than accusation. Stronger than your psychology. <laughs> you know, what you feel today. What you, Your moods and your thoughts. This outlasts your moods. Outlasts your thoughts. Is stronger than everything that's broken. So, Father, I thank you for each one here. I thank you for them. I bless them in Jesus' name. Holy Spirit, right now, we just invite you with your power to seal these things in our hearts. Take my joy.